The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Yo, Philly, how you doing? Welcome to <laughs> Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. This is Bill Cachetis, your host on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. At the beginning of the season, Sports Illustrated's Tom Verducci wrote an essay on the hitting revolution that's taking place in Major League Baseball. According to Verducci, hitters are being coached to hit the ball deep and in the air. For evidence, he points to the three uh, seasons between 2015 and 2017 when batters hit 3,023 fewer ground balls and 1,196 more home runs, including a record 6,105 homers last year. There were also 3,157 more fly balls and 2,658 more strikeouts. Teams scored 4.65 runs per game in 2017, up from 4.07 in 2014. Verducci attributes the homer-happy hitting revolution to three developments that have drastically changed MLB offenses, technology, analytics, and failed ball players turned private hitting tutors. Here to help us make sense of the current hitting revolution is Philly's Hall of Fame third baseman, Mike Schmidt, who knows a thing or two about hitting. <laughs> Over the course of his 18-year career, Mike won three Most Valuable Player awards, eight National League home run, six Silver Slugger uh, awards, four RBI titles, and ten gold gloves. Inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1995, Mike is also a member of MLB's All-Century Team and the greatest third baseman in the history of the game. Mike is also the author of several books, including The Mike Schmidt Study, Hitting Theory, Skills, and Technique, which was published in 1994 by McGriffin Bell. Today, he's a member of the Phillies television broadcast team, remaining current on the latest trends in the game. Welcome back to the podcast, Mike. Yeah, good evening, Bill. <clears throat> it's so nice to be with you, and uh, it sounds like a very interesting subject. Let's get to it. Um, All right. Mike, are you seeing the same Homer happy trends among today's hitters that Verducci identified in Sports Illustrated? Well, I, I think that's simplifying it uh, quite a bit. Uh, the numbers <clears throat> that you quoted uh, from the Verducci essay uh, were quite uh, specific, quite impressive. Uh, some of them I hadn't heard before. Um, it does seem like the runs scored in baseball are up over that period of time. And it does seem like, or it seemed like, it, 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 he's uh, factually found out that strikeouts are also higher up and ground balls um, are fewer. Um, so to call all of that um, information um, to be homer happy, um, I guess would be uh, would, would be legitimate. Um, I, do, I wouldn't want to call a player a hitter to his face home or happy. Um, <clears throat> I think that's more of a loose term that uh, that may be used by the media, may be used by uh, writers such as Verducci uh, in, in a way of labeling new trends in our game, but uh, the new hitting trends in our game. Um, but that's um, Quite a simplification. Uh, yes, I believe they are being coached to put the ball in the air as opposed to putting the ball on the ground. That in its simplest form would be something I totally disagree with. However, that's just me, and that is my opinion. Of course, I played baseball uh, in the 70s, 80s. Um, that's a long time ago. And if you would have tried to tell me back in those days that you'd be better off if you hit the ball in the air, I would say you're crazy. I would say if the ball goes in the air, it has a better chance of being a home run or a deep fly ball off the wall or a deep line drive if it goes in the air by accident. But if somebody says me to me, did you ever try to hit home runs, I would say, well, in the at-bats where I might have tried to hit a home run, I generally fouled the ball off or generally hit a long fly ball or popped up the infield and made it out. So I've always be, been a proponent of doing everything, in your, doing everything in your power to try not to hit the ball in the air. 
So that's a quick description of how I totally disagree with the idea of ball in the air versus ball on the ground. Now, um, I'll quickly try to finish my point. Back then, they did not have drastic shifts on hitters as they do now. Back then, the ballparks were a little larger. Back then, um, the, the, we only had two bat companies. So the bats, as well as the balls, by the way, were uh, not as lively as they are today. Pitching was not quite as tough to hit as it is today. Um, you know, therefore, I'm not against being convinced that they're not doing the right thing. I think there are some sort of uh, spinoffs of this whole thing, which can be chatted about as well. Then that's boring ball games, um, cavalier attitude towards strikeouts. Um, batting average is not meaning much anymore because, you know, they're, they're accepting the strikeout and the long fly ball over the jam shot to the opposite field or the ground ball up the middle. So there's going to be fewer hits and more strikeouts. Um, so there are some spinoffs that I think are interesting. Um, but I am seeing a trend, obviously, in the direction that you referenced. Now, not everybody has the fast twitch movements that many power hitters have. So, you know, my assumption is that, at least from coaching, there are different skill sets to hitting for average and hitting for power. Uh, are, are these skill sets, in, in the case of hitting the ball in the air, these different skill sets, are they being ignored here by, by the coaches? Um, let's see. I, I think the modern hitting coach, um, you know, I, they're not, they're not, they're smart. They're smart guys. And, they look at charts, they look at graphs, they look at analytics, they, they look at spray charts by hitters, they look at track man, which is uh, the same uh, unit as they use in golf. It determines uh, exit velocity. Um, it, it determines uh, the plane of the swing, the percentage at which the swing plane, or, or excuse me, the, the loft on the, on the ball as it's hit. Um, so they're looking at something that um, – makes a lot of sense you know you, you you can show a hitter factually um about his recent history and the swing plane and uh, and, and all of that and how how it's e either helped him or hurt him and in most cases if not all cases nowadays the hitting coaches can explain to a hitter that you would be better off with a slight uppercut than you would be with a a, a more level downward plane swing they want the ball to be hit in the air. Now, they do not want to – let, let me clarify that as well, because if there was a hitting – a modern-day hitting coach sitting here, he would correct, have stopped me and corrected me. What they want is a line drive up the middle. They do not want a ground ball up the middle. They would rather see a long fly ball trying to hit the line drive up the middle than they would, would want to see a ground ball up the middle. The idea is that the ground ball nowadays is perceived to be a possible two-out ground ball, i.e. hitting into a double play if you hit the ball into the shift, an automatic out if you hit the ball to the pull side in the shift. But the fly ball coming off of the line drive up the middle um, uh, foundation, in other words, hitters want to hit the line drive up the middle with a somewhere in the teens swing plane, like uh, a 15-degree to 18-degree, uh, once you start getting to 24, 26 degree swing planes, now you're talking about um, the plane that produces the optimum or the, the optimum plane for the home run. And they would rather see the swing that might produce a home run versus the swing that might produce a ground ball. Um, therein, therein lies the difference for me. I would rather see the swing produce a hard ground ball than a fly ball. Now, you, you cited a number of reasons uh, for this hitting revolution, and you talked about defensive shifts. You, you know, you talked about the um, preoccupation with, you know, ball in the air. Uh, Verducci also cites pitching velocity, and he points out that between 2002 and 2014, the average fastball jumped from 89 to 91.8 miles an hour, and that increase 
That increase of almost three miles an hour reduced the hitter's margin for error and resulted in the swing that was on plane or mirrored the path of the pitch rather than the downswing advocated earlier. I mean, I've always coached kids to take the knob of the the the, the bat to the ball. Apparently, they're teaching these guys to take the knob of the bat to the batter's eye, uh, and, and they're starting with the hands higher. Now, I remember when you made your changes, uh, you went from an upswing to more of a downswing, and we'll get in. We'll get into that a little bit more later. And then, you know, you created a hybrid bet- between, you know, two uh, traditional or rather traditional styles of hitting. So I wasn't surprised when you said that you would never, you know, try to purposely hit the ball, you know, for a home run. Uh, but it does appear that that that's what is happening here, especially when people are not made accountable for as many strikeouts that are being is recorded right now. Am I, am, am I right on that? Well, let me make a couple of points. Uh, first of all, when you say downswing, or when I say downswing, um, it, may, it may be better off for me to choose a different um, uh, word than down. Um, the reason I use the word down is because in my mind, I'm trying to make the bat go on a downward plane to the ball, um, which means that my bat head, the head of my bat, would be descending to the ball. And then what what naturally happens when the bat descends to the ball is the um, the the natural release of the top hand and the bottom hand rolls over, and the bat travels through the hitting plane, through the hitting zone, through contact perfectly level to, let's say, to the ground, if you if you will. Um, and, you know, it's like a railroad track. My bat, the plane of my bat and the ground I'm standing on would be as long as it could possibly be in the contact zone, allowing me to spray the ball all over the ballpark and increasing my chances of line drives. And the the um, where I think the rubber meets the road is here. One thing that everybody is forgetting about, you know, baseball is a game of uh, let, let's call it imperfection, if you will. Um, so often do we miss hit the baseball? We pop it up, we ground it out, um, and, and then we also hit it solid on the line. But what happens between the balls that we contact that aren't executed into line drives? Well, like I said, they're either pop ups or ground balls. I believe the ball that's missed, if it's missed on the ground and not in the air, has a much higher percentage chance of being productive in terms of hard ground ball, uh, flare over second base. Uh, I believe anybody can catch a fly ball. I don't believe it's that easy to catch ground balls. You know what I mean? You have to be in the right spot. They're, they're hard. You know what I mean? Um, however, there again, I must also add to that, I'm not adding in the shifting factor. In other words, I played before the shift, so that's the way I hit. There were a lot of holes in the infield, and my line, my hard ground balls could find those holes. Maybe a little bit different right now, and especially for me, if they had four fielders on the left side of second base, I might have had a little bit of different tune about hitting the ball on the ground. Um, do you understand that? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, It it seems to me, though, that what this hitting revolution is focusing on uh, is a a little bit different than the kind of hitter you were. Uh, I mean, these guys are focusing on hitting on the bottom third of the ball and on just a slight upswing, whereas as as your hitting changed over your career, you were squaring up to the ball. I mean, you were hitting, you know, line drives that were hit, hit square on the ball. And the other thing is, when you began when you began your career, you seemed to hit the fastball in front, out out in front of the zone because you pulled the ball to left field as a right-handed hitter. But That's what true. these guys are these guys are doing, and then as as you studied and and you you uh, changed your swing, you let the ball come deeper into the zone. But what these guys are doing is they're hitting the fastball deep in the zone. You know, okay, so let me interrupt you for a second. The only reason that as I got older and learned more about hitting and went to the level swing as opposed to the downswing, um, 
I was allowed now to allow the fastball to get deeper in the hitting zone. I did not have to hit the fastball out in front of the plate as much because I sprayed the ball all over the field when I became a good hitter, and I became a good hitter when I tried to keep the ball out of the air. Let me add one more thing to this uh, uh, subject. The analytical, well, you know, the, the analysis that, that they're using now with uh, analytics and sabermetrics to produce this information for today's coaches and hitters, I do not believe takes into, the count, into account the height of the pitch as it's approaching the batter. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that the upswing or the, let's call it uh, the um, 20 to 26 degree upward plane swing that supposedly is the optimum home run launch angle uh, can handle the ball at all if the ball in the hitting zone is waist high or above. Right. So, I believe that uh, analytics, this analytics and analytical information that uh, is being used, basically has the has the hit it has the batted ball low in the strike zone, or at least a knee high, uh, thigh high. But if you swing at a ball belt high, belly button high, letter high, which they do quite often, with an uppercut and no top hand involved to take the head of the bat through the ball. You cannot hit it. That's why you see so many strikeouts nowadays. Pitchers, as you watch catchers on the center field camera, catchers will hold the glove high in the strike zone, and pitchers will just throw it 93, 94 miles an hour high in the strike zone, and the batter strikes out. Right. That's right. Because the uppercut cannot hit the high fastball. That is, that's, that's correct. And you are seeing more. You're right. You are seeing more of that. Um, let, let's go for the sake of, of, of the listeners and particularly the younger generation that, that, that's, that's listening right now because they're attuned to podcasts. They, they don't listen to sports uh, radio as much. I, I, I want to go back to hitting theory and, and how it's changed and then specifically how you adjusted over the course of your, your career. Um, and and hitting, hitting theory, as you know, has changed considerably since 1970 when, when Williams – uh, wrote Ted Williams wrote his book The Science of Hitting, and, and that was considered the Bible for every player from little league through the majors. Well, Bill, let me Williams really had, quick say, let, let me really quick throw this in. I don't think that Ted Williams' um, uh, theory is that far off of modern day theory. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, Ted, well, okay. Ted, we'll get to Ted yeah, preached I, a, a slight uppercut. Yeah, I think that's where, you know, I think that's where I'm going with this. Uh, Williams advocated what is called the rotational swing. Uh, and that's based on the rotation of the hip, which allows the hitter to shift his weight from back to front. In addition, Williams started his hands low. He hitched and he swung on a slightly upward path, as you said, to counterbalance the downward trajectory of the pitch. Um, now, I've looked at film of you hitting in the early to mid-1970s, and you were a rotational hitter. Your hands didn't start as low as Williams, and you swung with a more pronounced uppercut than he did, but both of you rotated the torso from front to back, and at point of contact, the hands and wrists assumed the, the same action like, like, like that of a, a lumberjack chopping down a tree with an axe. Now, am I correct on that? Yes, yes, I think you are. I, I wasn't uh, early in my career in the 70s. I was not um, aware or I, I was not tuned in to the level to down swing. I was not tuned in to driving the ball, to trying to visualize driving the ball back at the pitcher's knees. I was more uh, into um, – the swing, um, the, di the dynamic I thought about mostly then was um, swing tempo or swing, swing rhythm. If I could get myself to swing smooth and soft and on balance, I mean, that's where I, that's where I put my um, uh, thinking back in the day. Uh, it wasn't until the mid to late 80s where I adopted uh, um, the downswing technique. Uh, my batting average, when I developed in, in, in 86 and 87, where I developed the, the approach of swinging down through the ball, my batting average jumped 30 points. I hit 
I hit 290 two years in a row. I lowered my strikeouts by almost 50 in both of those years. So I'm a living example of what I think is the best way to hit. Um, again, I will say this. I did not hit into shifts like they do nowadays. But uh, you know what? In 86 and 87, when I was a hit, I won my third MVP in 86, when I hit, they would not have shifted on me. They would have played straight up in the infield, straight up in the outfield, because I hit the ball everywhere. Now, prior to 86 and 87, you could have put the whole infield on the left side of, of second base, and I would have had to figure out a new way to hit. Mm-hmm. To your point about Williams as advocating a very similar style to today's hitters, uh, you know, obviously you won the first three of your NL home run titles between – 1974 and 76. So wouldn't it be accurate to say that the rotational swing that Williams was advocating and that you used early in your career catered to the strength of power hitters? Is that not correct? Well, I I had natural power, yes. Um, Strong forearms, strong hands, um, um, an athletic swing. My swing was much like Reese Hoskins. I think Reese is a little more polished. Um, as a young hitter than I was. Uh, however, our stats are going to be very, very similar. You know, he's going to end up at 35 home runs and right around 100 RBIs. Uh, um, from 70, 74, 75, and 76, all of those years for me were very similar to what Reese is going to do this year, including batting average. Mm-hmm. They're very similar. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, well- Reese is, Reese is going to strike out this year uh, in the 160 range. Um, that's not too far off where I was early in my career. Now, aside from 1976, when you were in a slump and Ozark put you in the leadoff position to get you started in the spring of 1976, would you have ever hit number two in the lineup as Reese Hoskins does? No, I I would not have ever hit number two simply because uh, they, you know, it it, it was way before uh, the some of the things like pitchers batting eight, excuse me, and the question you answered me hitting number two in the lineup, the uh, Mike Trout I believe hits hits number two. Uh, I think that's where it started. Your best hitter should be your two hole hitter because. The only time you are actually a two-hole hitter is in the first inning. After that, if you hit the pitcher eighth and another speedster ninth, say Roman Quinn, it's Roman Quinn, Cesar Hernandez, and then technically your three-hole hitter, which is actually your two-hole hitter in the lineup. But for the rest of the game, he is literally a three-hole hitter. Okay. Okay. I get I, Would they I have done that, that with me? No, because they did not have that forward of thinking back then. Am I saying I agree with it? No. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, but I could understand it. You know, I, I could go, you know, to me, um, that's something in the modern day that uh, has come up. And I, I, don't, uh, I don't see a problem with it. Okay. Well, then let's go to your other example, Roman Quinn, hitting a double leadoff. Let's say he hits ninth. Okay. Now, would it, is it really appropriate to teach a, a hitter like Roman Quinn to hit in this current fashion, hitting the ball in the air when he's a speedster, you want him to get on base and ignite the offense? Wouldn't it be better to teach him Charlie Law's weight shift system, you know, balance more workable stance with greater rhythm, you know, having the bat and launch position, you know, as soon as the front foot touches down, hitting down through the ball and hitting the ball where it's pitched. Uh, Absolutely. I would, I would teach Roman Quinn to hit as few a fly balls as he could possibly hit throughout the year, maybe um, popping up to the infield or catcher. I'll give him uh, five or six, seven of those on the year. Flying out to the outfield, I'll give him – you know, maybe 10, 12 of, of those, maybe at the most 20, and I'm talking in a 600 at that season. If Roman Quinn would keep the ball on the ground and out of the air, he'd hit 320, 330. Mm-hmm. So th- this is not a one-size-fits-all fit- hitting revolution. 
I mean, even though there are some guys who probably shouldn't be changing their hitting style, uh, you know, it, it, it is being adopted by many of the players. Uh, for yeah, whatever. I believe that's a, I believe that's a, uh, a big mistake to, um, to allow Cesar Hernandez, Roman Quinn, uh, as two examples, to allow them to execute fly balls and not be held accountable. Okay, um, let's go back to you. Um, we talked about Ted Williams' rotational system, talked a little bit about Charlie Law and his weight shift system, uh, which is, was actually a modernization of the earliest hitting system in baseball. Uh, and, and then there's you, who came up with his own hybrid based on those two systems. In the late 70s and 80s, many hitters were adopting Law's system, including – George Brett, uh, you adopted elements of Law's hitting system in the 80s when you reinvented yourself as a hitter. And by 86, you developed the hybrid that not only enabled you to hit for a higher average while retaining your power numbers, but also to capture that third most valuable player award. Mike, what were the basic elements of that hybrid hitting system that you invented? Okay, let's, let's start with that. <clears throat> I was – Never throughout my career, what you would call a really good tough out with men in scoring position. Mm -hmm. I produced most of my RBIs with, um, I would say with home runs and sacrifice flies and uh, my batting average being 250 to 270, uh, prevented me with a high strikeout totals, prevented me, um, from being as good as I could be with men in scoring position. Let's just say much like the Phillies hitters today. I was very, way too prone to striking out, way too prone to pulling the ball, you know, rolling over the ball, as they call it, and making outs with men in scoring position. Yes, I hit my home runs. Yes, I had great numbers at the end of the year. Yes, I was an MVP, so on and so forth. But in my own mind, I was not as good a hitter as I should be with men in scoring position. And when I say men in scoring position, I mean getting that base hit up the middle with two outs and a man on second or third, you know, driving that run in, putting the ball in play when it needs to be put in play. So I developed a system that would give me the confidence to put the ball in play with men in scoring position, and I did that by saying I'm going to hit the ball early in the count and I'm going to put it between the white lines. I'm not going to swing and miss as much. I'm not going to foul the ball off as much. So if I swing down to the baseball, down to the baseball, the baseball has – a harder chance of getting to the top of my bat. Now, that's very important. The baseball has a harder chance, a less of a chance, of getting to the top of my bat. Now, the top of my bat is where the fly balls and the fat. Let's start at the top of, top is part of my bat. That's a, well, the top is part of my bat. If it misses my bat, is a swing and miss under the ball. If I make contact, it's a foul ball. If I make even more contact, it's a fly ball. If I make even more contact toward the equator of the ball, now it could become, you know, a long enough fly to become a home run. And that's, you know, that's where the fly ball, you know, you kind of forget about hitting the fly ball because if it just drops into the flowers at Citizens Bank Park, everyone's happy you hit a home run. But you were slow, so close to having a strike or a foul ball or swing and miss I believe that me swinging the bat down through the baseball and trying to hit the equator or above the equator on the ball put the ball in play more often and gave me more confidence that I could get a hit. And it's one way to, to, to point that out is very simply, I went from a 260 hitter to a 295 hitter, which means I hit more line drives, more ground balls that got in the hole and became a better hitter with men in scoring position. So that's when I became what I consider an all-around great hitter the last two years that I used the downswing theory. Okay. But I'll add one more thing. I did not hit into the shift like players are doing today. Okay. Uh, I know my answer to this question. Uh, I, I think you'd be a much more successful hitter in today's game, especially a situational hitter, if you walked onto the field and applied the hitting system 
that you developed in the 80s uh, than you would if you were, let's say, a purely rotational hitter or a liftoff guy like these guys. Well, Bill, Bill, they wouldn't shift on me with my 86 and 87 hitting theory. Right. The down the down to the ball theory, they would not shift on me. Right. They would play exactly. they would play me relatively straight up because I hit the ball hard at the second baseman a lot. Right. You know, I spent fourteen years in the league and I couldn't hit a ball to the second baseman. All of all of a sudden I started my you know, I started swinging down to the ball at all heights in the strike zone. I I pictured the ball up in the strike zone and I tomahawked it. I did whatever I could to get the right hand, the top hand through the baseball, down through the baseball, and I hit the ball everywhere. I, I hit a line drive over first base. I couldn't do that my entire career up to that point. Okay. So if you were to adopt what's going on right now as a hitter, you feel you'd be obviously much less successful, correct? Yes, I, I, I would be much less successful. Um, however, I think it would be a lot more fun. <laughs> Can you imagine going to home plate and just swinging, just swinging away, having a blast, you know, just like you're hitting a wiffle ball when you're a young kid in your backyard. Dad was pitching the wiffle ball to you and you, you smoked it up in the air over the neighbor's, over the neighbor's garage. How much fun was that? Well, that's pretty much what goes on with today's hitters. They have a blast. They go to home plate and they try to lift the ball, lift the ball. It's natural to lift the ball. It's fun to lift the ball. And there's no accountability for striking out and popping up to the infield when there are men in scoring position. You got it. I put Mike Schmidt in Citizens Bank ballpark right now in 2018 and let him go nuts with a, with a, a liftoff approach. He's going to break single-season old-time record 60 homers a year every season. No, okay, I hear you saying that. I hear you saying that. But the problem would be I'd have 200 strikeouts, and my batting average would, my batting average would be about 210. That's right. That's right. I mean, I'm looking at all these power-hitting guys, even some of the guys the Phillies got, their average is, is terrible. They're like 190s. I look at Joey Bats, uh, Jose Bautista, who was big power hitter when he was uh, in Toronto. Never much of an average guy, and the, his average is terrible this year. But a lot of these guys have, have low averages, but they're hitting lift off. And, 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 and this is, frankly, what frustrates me. And it's not just the Phillies. It's all these clubs. It, it really frustrates me because it doesn't appear – there doesn't appear to be accountability. I mean, when you treat strikeouts like with such a cavalier attitude um, – and then you trot that guy out there night after night after night. Um, I would just go crazy over that, absolutely crazy, because what it suggests to me is what are they thinking when they're going up to the plate to begin with? They're not even thinking about the situation. Uh, are they even thinking about the at-bat? Are they, thinking, are, are they being patient with an at-bat to try to force a walk? Are, are, are they just jumping on the first pitch? Uh, you know, what are they thinking? Are they, are they even thinking about strategy? Are they thinking about mechanics? Uh, you know, we both know you were criticized by the baseball writers, at least some of them, for thinking too much, you know, about your hitting. Well, yeah, I think, I, I think the general opinion about me was I would have been a lot better off with the attitude about hitting that we mentioned before, where I would just let myself go and have more fun and not try to be so perfect. Yeah, as a hitter, but I spent my entire career challenging myself to be a really, really good hitter. And all of the most of my career, I thought I was good at some things, but not good at other things. And I wanted to improve in the areas that I was bad. And the the general attitude today is not to experiment not to change, not so much to want to uh, challenge yourself to be an MVP caliber hitter, not look at um, past numbers or players from past eras and see how great they were as hitters and want to be as good as them. Um, I, I don't see hitters today uh, understanding the history of hitting. Um, I, I, I just 
think that these young men have their style, their approach, and they just they just run with it. Um, you know, again, I, that, that's my impression from looking from the outside. I've spent very little time in batting cages or very little time talking to the young hitters today because, as you as you know from listening to me, um, I don't want to go in there with my attitude or my approach to hitting and how it should be taught and ruffle any feathers. It's not my place, you know, it's not my place to do that. Um, um, I'm a friend with John Malley, their hitting instructor, and, uh, I, I, you know, it's, I, I really don't have any business going in there and, uh, you know, offering options uh, to his. So um, I kind of stay away, but um, I, I, I generally feel that there is, a, a prevailing attitude today that is not conducive to pushing these guys to a higher level as hitters. It, to me, it's, it's counterintuitive already to analytics because analytics focuses on patterns and production uh, in various facets. Uh, but, you know, uh, you got to think. You, you got to think. You got to hit situationally. You got to work on your mechanics uh, if you're going to meet those those goals analytically. Um, and 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 this, you know, again, this is what frustrates me about about baseball today. I just don't see the care being taken in the coaching. And, and again, I'm not just talking about the Phillies. And I, I realize the Phillies just let go a bunch of their hitting hitting instructors in the minor leagues. Um, so I, I don't know what's up with that, but, uh, it, you know, obviously they're not satisfied with the hitting instruction that, that's going on down there. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's, it's fair to say that we need a balance of traditional uh, methods as well as analytical. We, we really need a balance. To shift one way or the other is not going to be helpful. Um, well, yeah, you know, I mean, we're having this discussion, and this, you know, we're we're not just saying that this is the end all to the future uh, of, of coaching uh, mechanics uh, and hitting. I think it's a stage that we are going through. There's uh, a lot of spinoffs, um, too much time between balls put in play in the game. Uh, uh, there's going to be possibly some rules governing the shifting of defenses uh, put in play. Um, you know, the future uh, is, is not glim uh, because of our discussion here. Uh, so keep your head up. Um, uh, Billy, I, I have got something pulling at me on my end here. Um, okay. if, you don't, if you don't mind, it's been a great, great discussion. I've enjoyed it, um, and I'm sure we'll do it again. Great. Hey, thanks for being with us, Mike, and, and for all your contributions to the, the Phillies into baseball. And thank you, Philly fans, for tuning in. See you next week for another podcast of Philadelphia Baseball Past, Present, and Personal. This is Bill Kostadis, rounding third and heading home on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. This has been a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production.